Before I get into the video, there were some things I didn't address in the first episode. For one, Tone Hooker of Original Flavor created the name and logo for Rockefeller Records. I also said that Foxy Brown was on Dead Presidents, but that was a pure accident because I was looking at the cover art that has her name on it, but no, she was just on Ain't No with Jay-Z. Also, in 1999, Jay won a Grammy for Best Rap Album that year, even though he didn't attend the show. In 1999, Jay was quoted as saying, I am boycotting the Grammys because too many major rap artists continue to be overlooked. Rappers deserve more attention from the Grammy committee and from the whole world. If it's got a gun, everybody knows about it. But if we go on a world tour, no one knows. Before I get more into the video, I'd first like to thank you guys for coming to see this because you guys can be doing a million other things right now. But instead, you're here with me and I appreciate that. If you guys like the content, you guys should like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel grow. I reply to all the comments. And I love going through them and seeing what you guys think. Also, follow my Instagram too. That would be greatly appreciated. You guys can DM me some video ideas or just show me some love. Comment down below your favorite artist or group on The Rock and why. Favorite project, favorite mixtape. Also, represent where you're from in the comment section. I want to see where all of you guys are tuning in at. Definitely represent where you're from. Also, check out my pinned comment because I am going to ask what you guys want me to talk about in part three, just like what I did for part two. Part three will be about the years 2003 and 2004. Also, I felt like it was good to share that I'm expanding the series from three parts to four due to there just being so much information within what people perceive to be Rockefeller's prime, which was arguably between 2000 and 2004. I think it's better for the series and for me doing that. Without further ado, I give you the documentary of Rockefeller Part 2, The Rock on Top. The first release on Rockefeller Records in the year 2000 was Beanie Siegel's debut album, The Truth, which dropped in February of that year. Now, let's get into the backstory behind Beans. Beans grew up in Philly and actually got his rap name by combining his childhood nickname Beanie in the name of a South Philly street, which is Siegel Street. When Beanie was young, he would sell coach leather goods and work as a squeegee man by cleaning the windows of cars that were stuck at busy intersections, and then he would collect money from the drivers. He would also catch his first brush with the law at only the age of 14 years old. And sadly, in Beanie's own words, he said that he feels like he was never really out of the system. Beans got his start in the mixtape scene and would take rap seriously after Beans teamed up with Murder Mill and battled an up-and-coming crew which was named Philly's Most One, which was comprised of Mr. Man and Boo Bonic. Beans and Murder Mill and Philly's Most Wanted would rap over Destiny Child's No 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 Part 2 instrumental and Philly's Most Wanted was impressed by Beanie. The duo would then persuade Beanie to join them at a meeting with the heads of Rockefeller. At the meeting, Beanie impressed Jay-Z and Dame with his rhyming ability. His material was so raw, straightforward, and vivid. You could feel everything he said to a T. A couple of days after the meeting, Beanie was in a studio session for the song Reservoir Dogs, which is a track that would end up being included on Jay-Z's Volume 2 Hard Knock Life album. In an interview, Beanie said, Everything was new to me. I had never been in the studio. I never knew how to construct songs. Jay had to teach me how to count music and how to construct a hook. If you've watched the previous episode, you would already know how huge Volume 2 Hard Knock Life was because it was the album that really pushed Jay into the mainstream. More eyes on the album meant that a lot of people would hear the song Reservoir Dogs and the buzz around Beanie would grow. He would appear in a few more songs in 1998 and a whole bunch in 1999. Finally, in February of 2000, 
Beanie dropped his debut album, The Truth, and it sold 155,000 copies in its first week. And it peaked at number five on the Billboard 200 chart. The first song off of the album, which is titled after the title of the album, and it's one of my favorite songs by Beans ever. This song would also be a good look for an up and coming producer at the time, who the world knows today as Kanye West. You see, Kanye was an up and coming producer born in Atlanta, but raised in Chicago. Kanye grew an affinity for art and music at an early age. He was selling beats as a teenager, and Kanye's mom would help Kanye with his dreams by paying his studio time. Kanye would meet with producer No ID when he was 14 or 15 and play him a song that he made called Green Eggs and Ham after the famous Dr. Seuss book. Kanye would take the advice No ID gave him and No ID would mentor Kanye. Kanye would really get his big start in music by getting one of his first big major placements by producing for Jermaine Dupri for his song Turn It Out on his platinum album, Life in 1472. He got paid $5,000 for the beat and the song. After this, Kanye would have a meeting with Columbia Records for a record deal, and Kanye believed so much that he would get a record deal that he dropped out of school. More on this when we talk about the college dropout in the next episode. Kanye would go to Columbia Records, and in the meeting, Kanye would make so many bold statements. He was talking about how he was going to be better than Jermaine Dupri, and he would sell more records than him. And the funny thing is, is that the meeting was with Michael Malden, who is Jermaine Dupri's dad. Like, <laughs> he was saying all this, saying he was going to be bigger than Jermaine, all this. But little did he know that he was talking to his dad. Like, <laughs> Kanye being crazy, man. But long story short, obviously, Kanye did not get the deal. And he was really heartbroken over this. But Kanye locked in and really perfected his craft. He would move to New Jersey from Chicago and set up shop. Kanye would shop his music around and he came to Rockefeller. And Beanie admired his sound to his beats because they were so different. Beanie didn't really care if a producer had a big name or not, and only really cared about creating a new sound. Kanye would play a couple beats for Beanie, and the beat that would end up being the beat for the song The Truth stood out. Beanie liked how grimy it was and how it was just so different. Beanie said that he called Kanye The Truth, and then that ended up being what the record was named. Beanie has also said that he never named his debut album and the title of The Truth was picked. Love this album, by the way. True, true classic. Another song on the album that I want to talk about is the second song on the album, which is Who Want That by Beanie Siegel. And this song also had another big production placement by another up and coming producer that you guys might know today as Just blaze and just like kanye he had an interest in music very early on just blaze got his first big break when he was working at his day job at the time and an a and r from rockefeller called him asking to speak to just blaze just blaze hung up the phone thinking that it was a prank call the a and r called back and said that he was serious and that he was looking for just blaze so Jess Blaze jumped at the opportunity because The Rock was looking to construct a production team of people like Just, Kanye, and Rock Wilder. Who Want That was one of the first official songs Just Blaze did for Rockefeller. In an interview for Complex about the song, he said, I had the beat already done and gave it to Kiambo Hip Hop Joshua, who was the A&R for Rockefeller Records at the time. They heard the record and they just went in, did it, and mixed it. I didn't know as many people liked that record as they did until I was out one night and I heard it playing out of five cars driving past. In August of that year, the documentary Backstage came out, which chronicled the 1999 Hard Knock Life Tour with acts like Jay-Z, DMX, Method Man, and Red Man. 
This documentary was also produced by Dame Dash. The film featured live performances and gave an in-depth look at what happened backstage. So many moments in this film, such as Dame Dash going off on Kevin Lyles for giving Rockefeller artists Def Jam jackets. Bruh, the look on Dame Dash's face when Memphis Bleak was talking about the jacket, like, bruh, just had me dying. Like, <laughs> I'm talking about just pure, just hatred, man. There was also the cypher with DMX and Jay-Z and footage of their rap battle. Well, at least Jay's part of the rap battle because DMX's wasn't recorded. Now, the question of who won the battle depends on who you ask. Some people are going to say Jay and some people are going to say X did. It's very debatable. What's funny is that actually Jay-Z is not a stranger to rap battles, especially back in the day. And he's even battled the likes of Buster Rhymes when he was in high school. Biggie had also attended the same high school too in Brooklyn, New York. Here's a video of Jay talking about the success of the tour. And how, do, how do you, I mean, besides doing a successful tour, it seems like rap artists always have to work triple the exactly. amount of time that other artists have to right. prove a point. Right, it's, 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 that's what it is. It's that, I guess it's that rebellious music. You know, we always fighting to be heard and we always, you know, we always, de we always uh, defending ourselves. We didn't do it, you know. It's like something's missing. You know who they're coming to see, you know. But, you know. That's our job, so are you gonna and we do, did it. Yeah. So yeah. are you guys gonna try to make this a yearly event? That would be nice. You know, we just back now, so you know, everything is. You're like you're not trying to get back yeah. on the road. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So. Yeah. If you asked me that in two more weeks, maybe I have a great answer for you. <laughs> the soundtrack for the film was released a month before the film was released, and if you want to know more about this film, then I suggest you go look it up and watch it. The next album that was released on Rockefeller in 2000 was All Money Is Legal by Emil, which was her debut album. In 1997, Emil was in a group called Major Coins, and the group met Jay-Z, who at the time was looking for a woman to provide vocals on his third album, Volume 2, Hard Knock Life. The part for the female was really for her friend, but when Jay asked Emil to freestyle, he liked it. He then decided to put Emil on the song instead. Emil wanted to remain loyal to her friend, but Jay allowed them both to do a version of the song. As we know, Jay went with Emil's version, and that song went on to be Can I Get Up. The group Major Coins would break up, and Emil would embark on a solo career under Rockefeller Records, and she would soon join the 1999 Hard Knock Life Tour. The first single for her debut album was released in early July of 2000. The single was the song, I Got That. This song is not only notable because it's the first single for the album, but also the first single in which Beyonce performs solo without the other members of Destiny's Child. The second single, For The Fam, was released in late July of 2000, and it featured Memphis Bleak, Jay-Z, and Benny Siegel. First off, that beat is just crack. It's just crazy. That beat, crazy. One of my favorite beats from the Rockefeller days, for sure. But the producer for the song, Ty Fi, had this to say about the track. That record was made for Jay. That's when Jay and Dame was rocking heavy. They was buying every beat. I was cooking up something for Jay, but they bought it for a mill. I got to lay the beat, Bleak goes in, blacks out. Bean goes in, blacks out. Now I'm up at Def Jam again. Guess who I run into? Jay-Z. He says, you don't have to get on that beat, right? The album All Money Is Legal will peak at number 45 on the US Billboard 200 chart and sell 29,000 copies in its first week. This would definitely not be a good look at all. Because for instance, Beanie released his debut album the same year and he did 155,000 copies in his first week, which was 100,000 copies more than her. She flopped pretty hard, and at this point, her future was looking very shaky on the rock. Two months after that album released, the Dynasty Rock La Familia album was released in October of 2000. The album would peak at number one on the Billboard 200 charts, selling 557,000 copies in its first week. The first single for the album was I Just Wanna Love You, Give It To Me, 
was released in mid-October, before the album came out. Here's a video of Jay talking about the Switch. So, um, why Switch and singles? Like, we were all thinking like... What happened was, I, I had parking lot up and running. It's an incredible hot song. I was ready to, all ready to go with it. But the next day I made this song, and it, it was just a vibe. And it's just a vibe of everyone in the studio, the immediate reaction. People were singing it by the time the second hook came on. And I know right there, those type of songs. I know, I made a couple of them. You know what I'm saying? So I know what type of song this is right here. It's, it's, not, it's no stopping. I'm unstoppable right now with this song. I mean, that's saying a lot because Parking Lot's haven't been just like a hit. Like, yeah. It's written all over it yeah. anyways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it, you can do so much with Parking Lot Pimpin' too. Bumper stickers, all kind of different things. Like, it, it's just a hit. It's, it's definitely a hit. This one right here is just out of control. It's just unstoppable. So Let's we talked about this song a little bit. Like, what's this song about? How did you just, you just like came up with it just like that? Yeah, my man Sparks, he had this hook for a while, and I was looking for a beat for it. I was looking all over. I was calling, you know, a lot of producers, telling you I got a hit. I'm telling you I got a hit. All I need is a track that match it. And uh, it took me a couple of weeks, but I, I really, I, I found the track. Neptunes did it. You know, he got a song out now. He got a song with Mystical right now, and that's, I think, the number one rap and crossover song. So. He's in a little zone right now. So shout out to Pharrell, you know what I'm saying? Good looking. Another song that I want to talk about on this album is the intro track. And I know in my DMX video that you should totally watch, by the way. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I said that DMX's intro to his debut album is one of the greatest intros of all time. Which, in my opinion, it, st it still is. It still is. But this intro, at least instrumental-wise, gives it a run for its money. I'm not even gonna lie. I still love the song, don't get me wrong, but geez, like the beat to this song is just sick. It's just sick, man. But I really felt like if I was alive during this time, I would have been literally listening and seeing the true rise of a dynasty because this beat in the intro of the album is just, just crazy. The beat for the song was made by Just Blaze. And in an interview, Just Blaze said, it took about a year before Jay took notice and started paying attention. Once we did get in the studio, it was like Batman and Robin. That intro is probably the meanest beat on the Dynasty. The fact that I did it and that it was the first thing you heard when you put the CD in, it set the tone perfectly for that album. The last album from Rockefeller that dropped in 2000 was Memphis Bleak's The Understanding, which released in December of 2000. The album would peak at number 16 on the Billboard 200 chart. The first single for the album, My Mind Right, was actually on DJ Clue's Backstage, a Hard Knock Life soundtrack. And the original song, initially at first, wasn't a hit. But when Bleak did the remix with H Moneybags, Jay-Z, and Benny Siegel, when they all hopped on it, the song began to pick up steam for the summer of 2000. The song was most notable for Jay-Z's attack on Harlem World member Mino, who had previously dissed Jay on Dame Grease's I'm That. Bleak was questioned as to why Jay was so ruthless, and Bleak said, cause they went at Hove. When you go at the guy, he give it to you. I ain't even know who Mino is. Like literally, he dissed him, then I don't even know who he was. 2000 was also the year Dame Dash would meet singer Aaliyah through his accountant. I'm saying this now for people to know that I'm talking about all the drama with Beyonce, Aaliyah, all that in the last episode because that's where I plan to go back and reveal a lot of things because right now I'm talking about the music and some other side events, but in the last episode, I'm really gonna go back and start covering the drama well, like with things like that and even like Beanie getting arrested and trial and stuff like that and what all led up to the breakup of The Rock. 2001, in my opinion, music-wise, was a very interesting year for The Rock. It started off hot when in January of that year, Jay called up Funkmaster Flex to let him know that he was going to appear on Flex's show later that evening with his new acts. Jay-Z, however, wouldn't rap, but he instructed Flex to get the beats ready. 
this was going to really be a real test for people like Freeway, Sparks, and Young Chris because they were at this time relatively new on The Rock, especially with the song 1900 Hustler off of the Dynasty Rock La Familia album being the first real introduction people had to Freeway. In an interview about the opportunity of being on Flex's show at Hot 97, Freeway said, I was ready for it. I spent the entire week beforehand getting my bars ready. My whole mind frame was, this is my platform. This is the first time the world is really going to hear me. Those artists, including Freeway, would proceed to rhyme over different beats for an hour and absolutely kill it while Jay-Z was ad-libbing in the background. Flex said, that was a little unusual for me to have a bunch of unknown rappers freestyling. I probably wouldn't have done it if it weren't for Jay-Z. The first album to drop on The Rock in 2001 was DJ Clue's The Professional 2, which released in February of 2001, and it peaked at number three on the Billboard 20 chart. This was way different from the first tape, The Professional, because it had West Coast and Southern artists on it instead of the predominantly New York artists so we could start to see a shift in the culture. Two months after this album came out though, on April 26th, a young king was born. I'm just saying that now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's me. You know, Taurus gang, all that. You know, birthday coming soon. So, you already know how it is. Um, but, <laughs> now nah, I'm The second album that dropped in 2001 from The Rock was The Reason by Beanie Siegel, which released in June of that year. The Reason peaked at number five on the Billboard 200 charts, selling 151,000 copies in its first week. The album spawned two singles, which were Mac B and Think It's a Game. The producer behind Mac B is once again Just Blaze, and he had this to say about the track. It's funny because I forget that people really like that record. When I DJ, I never play it, but I was playing a set in DC this past weekend, and I said, ah, let me just see what happens. I was playing a set of my old records, and people went nuts. I forget because when that record came out, I was so in the hole. I mean, like I was in a hole, a baseline, not really going out anywhere. I was a studio hermit, so a lot of times I would have records out that were rocking and I had no idea that they were getting played in the clubs or on the radio or that they were in heavy rotation. I was a robot just doing what I had to do. The other song I, I want to talk about on this album is Mom's Praying, which featured Southern rap legend Scarface. Once again, this track was produced by Jess Blaze and was one of the first records he entirely mixed in Pro Tools. It's also funny because Kanye used the same sample for this song for an unreleased song he did himself. In an interview, Jess Blaze said, Kanye West actually called me about the record one day like, yo, did you use this sample? And he played it for me and I said, yeah, that's Mom's Praying. He had just written a song and done a beat to it. He was tight because his song was really good, but he scrapped it because I had just done it for Beans. I actually heard the song. This year, we would also see a beef brew with Jada Kiss and Beanie Siegel. That deserves a video just like in itself, like that, like that be third video in itself. So maybe at a later date, I'll go more in depth with that topic. So if I miss something, yo, I can always do that video. But on Wax in 2001, Jada Kiss released his debut album, Kiss the Game Goodbye. On his song, Uh Huh, he sent some serious, you know what I mean? Serious, serious shots at Benny Siegel. He was not playing. I've also seen that Rap City Basement video where Beanie and State Property were going at D Block. Heavy. They was at the top, bro. It was it was scary. Yo, like, even like Big Tigger was in the corner, like, and he even looked super scared when uh, Beanie 
and State Property was rapping. Yo, hey yo, J A D A, pink of the kiss. No matter how I look at it, think of a chick. No matter how I switch it up, think of an act that can't stick to the script. I'ma give him a clip. Styles die on a holiday. Kiss die on a holiday. Shots like first of the year. Uh huh. your block like first of the month. You get shot from the front to the rear. Got Glocks in the back of the trunk. Got punks on the back of the seat. Young punks on the back of the street. AKs in their hand. They let the latest movie edit their life. I keep the latest Uzi letting a pipe. That's gangster. I'm in the class all by myself. When they ass all by myself. That's danger. You want a war, nigga? That's what it is. Full metal jackets, dressing your kids. They screaming. 2001 was also the year that Jay rocked Summer Jam when he brought out Michael Jackson. He would also preview the song Takeover, where he took shots at Prodigy of Mob Deep and infamously put up old pictures of him. Truly a crazy scene. After the show, we got probably one of the most funniest, but at the same time weird clips we got from Rockefeller from this era. Some of y'all know what I'm about to talk about and what I'm about to play. I don't know if Jay-Z was just tired from all the things that just happened. Because literally, he freaking just brought out Michael Jackson. Like, bro, Michael Jackson, like, at this point, even to the point where he died, was, like, bigger than life. Like, this dude was, like, a god. Like, people fainting when they see him. So, like, he just brought out Michael Jackson. But, yeah, but he was just, Jay-Z was just looking stuck. And Dame Dash and everybody's, like, screaming around him and stuff like that. Y'all, but, y'all, I'm going to just play the clip. It's live. We the champions. You heard Michael it. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> we live. King of rap, rap the king of pop. Rap. Holla. Turned out crazy. Yeah. Big event, 20,000. It's we the rock, pop. you bastards. As always, you heard. Holla. Beanie. We don't do much. Summer Jam 2001, man. How was it for you, man? We don't do much. <laughs> we right here. Big celebration as always, man. We don't do much. That's it. It's a wrap. <laughs> we out of here. In September of 2001, Jay drops his sixth studio album, The Blueprint. And unfortunately, the same day that he dropped, the 9-11 attacks happened. The Blueprint would sell over 427,000 copies in its opening week and it peaked at number one on the Billboard 20 chart. Here's a video of Jay talking about the album. We heard that you have nine songs. 15, you yeah, late. <laughs> 15 already? Yeah, 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 slow, man. You got 15 now and I'm ready for them, yeah. And so how come you went back so quickly and how did you get them done so fast? What happened was um, I usually make an album a year since 96, since Reasonable Doubt, I always put out an album, I always have, I mean, if you listen to any one of my albums, it's just the emotion and what I felt during that time, you know what I'm saying, so, you know, I had a lot going on, so I had a lot, lot to write about, you know, I went in the studio one day, I made seven songs, that just goes to show you, like, like my, my music is, is what's going on in my life, you know what I'm saying, so that one day, I made seven songs. And from there, it was just like, it just was like spilling, just spilling. Now we up to 15. I don't know, I might make 30. The first single, Izzo, would be released back in August, and there is some controversy behind the song. For those who have watched my video on Cameron and Jay-Z, link in the description, you already know the backstory behind the track. 2001 would also be the year that Cameron joined Rockefeller. And you know what? I'm just I'm I'm just play the clip. Rockefeller gave the diplomats a label, and we gave State Property a label. But Cam was moving a little quicker than Beans. I told Beans, Beans, I'm gonna make you a vice president. Cam, I'm gonna make you a vice president. But the way a boss does, Cam went to the radio quick, just when we were discussing it, and told the whole world. We hadn't even negotiated it. So now, everybody on the label, I'm talking about everybody is like, what, I gotta ask him for videos now? They was staying friends, so I guess the tension between Jay and Dame came. They was trying to give Cam a vice president position or something like that. And Vito was out of town, so when Vito flew in, he was like, whoa, what's going on? We was cool, like, State Property and Dipset got along. We was all coming from the same place, so it wasn't no tension between us. We always were bosses. Now we on Rockefeller. We like, what do you do? It was like, nah, they ain't like a big brother. We going crazy in this shit. You can't tell us no. Who gonna tell us no? We went dumb in Rockefeller. There seemed to be friction 
in the camp. You knew something, something was going on, but you didn't know the, you know, the severity of it. You didn't know how bad it was. Fucking Kanye sells us a few beats. We watching the BET Awards. Jay Z about to perform his new single, and he gets up there, and it's the beat that we brought from Kanye, which would now be H to the Izzo. So now we steam it. Basically, I guess Cam originally had the beat and was going to record a record to it. But next thing you know, Jay is performing a song to the beat. And of course, they're ticked off about it. Kanye was even surprised that Jay-Z performed the track at the 2001 BET Awards. Because in the interview, Kanye said, I was on the phone with my girl and she just started screaming. And my two-way pager started blowing up. I was just thinking, dang, that was like the time in the movie Five Heartbeats when they heard the song on the radio and they start running through the crib. If they ever do a movie about me, that's one of the spots they're going to have to put in the movie. This song is really going to change my life. Until an artist of Jay-Z's caliber co-signs for you, the industry doesn't believe in your skills. Now they know. Also, I found this quote from G. Robertson, who was the A&R for Rockefeller at the time during the blueprint. He said, Cameron was working on the track at the time. Our system was really on some new age Motown. We treated it no differently than when Barry Gordy used to have his producers cook up the beat and then he gives it to his writers and then the best song wins in that case. We never had a situation where we earmarked the track for that one artist. The beat CD was the beat CD. It wasn't just a J CD or a Cam CD or a Beanie Siegel CD. Another song that I want to talk about off of the blueprint is the song Renegade. This is definitely a standout track on the album and it has an interesting background. Eminem is the only feature on the blueprint and he actually produced the song. Originally, the song was supposed to be a collaboration between Eminem and Royce the 5'9", but obviously, we know that Jay-Z took his place. This song came at an interesting time because a lot of critics were saying that Jay-Z was just rapping about the bling and the jewelry and had forgotten his ghetto roots with his newfound riches. Eminem, on the other hand, was dealing with people saying that he was a negative influence on kids. You also have to look at the title of the song and look up what the definition of a renegade is. By definition, a renegade is a person who deserts and betrays an organization, country, or set of principles. Now that those things are said, things might make a little bit more sense now why the song is titled that and why they rap about the things that they rap about on the song. This song is also of importance because there's a famous argument about this track, mainly spearheaded by Nas, claiming that Jay got washed by Eminem on his own track. Back in the day, that was a huge no-no being washed on your own track. If it was your track, you couldn't let no one outshine you. So this was pretty disrespectful for Nas to say at the time. Put in the comments down below who you think had the better verse on Renegade. Speaking of Nas though, we obviously have to talk about TakeOver. As said earlier, Jay-Z performed a rough version of TakeOver at Summer Jam earlier in the year, but those parts he rapped about were mainly aimed at Mob Deep. It was like a bait or test. When TakeOver dropped, it was on, and the beef with him and Nas was boiling. He name dropped him in the third verse, and he was just going off. He was making fun of Nas for modeling for Carl Kanai and Willie Esco, calling him a fake thug, admitting that he sampled Nas's voice, but he said that Nas made it a hot line while Jay made it a hot song. And Jay alluding to the fact that he had an affair with the mother of Nas's first child, which Jay-Z did. Yikes. Nas would officially respond to the takeover on Jay-Z's birthday, which is December 4th. The track that we all know today is Ether, and I think Ether was actually floating around earlier due to DJ K Slay before it was officially released. There were three versions of Ether. Of course, we have the version we have today, and then there was a version that was deemed too soft, and then a version that was deemed too hard, which is the one with the Aaliyah line and Nas going at Dame Dash 
saying that it should have been him in the plane. And yeah, and I'm pretty sure you guys would know the rest. But I've seen people argue about which is better, Takeover or Ether. But in my opinion, I feel like Ether is better. I've heard people say Takeover is the better song or whatever, but Ether is the better diss or blah, 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 all that stuff. But all in all, what do you guys say when someone gets beat and whatever? They don't say that they got Takeover. They say that they got Ether. We all say that you got Ether. Nas was wigging on Ether, in my opinion. And Jay-Z would reply a couple times, I think, but it just wasn't, it just wasn't enough to just beat Ether. Ether was just Ether. It just was just, just Ether. But put down in the comments which one is better. Takeover or Ether. One thing I want to talk about in 2001 to happen in Rockefeller is that I know that MOP was on The Rock. I couldn't find like an exact date when they were messing with The Rock, but I do know that they had been recording a project that was going to be titled Ghetto Warfare between 2001 and 2003. The project would be shelved and it eventually released in 2006. The last release on Rockefeller in 2001 was the Jay-Z Unplugged album that contained some of Jay's past songs with live instruments that were performed by The Roots. The album was recorded during the taping of the MTV Unplugged 2.0 episode in November of 2001. 2002 was another year on top for The Rock. But this year, they really were targeting getting into the film industry with three movie releases in the same year. State Property, Paper Soldiers, and Paid in Full. Paid in Full is one of my favorite movies ever, but we'll get into that in a bit. The State Property movie came out in mid-January of 2002, and it would star members of State Property, Dame Dash, and Memphis Bleak. The film also had cameos from Jay-Z, Emil, DJ Clue, etc. Jay just cracks me up because like he seems like he didn't even like want to be in the movie like during his parts, but like man, it's just so funny. But definitely go out and check that movie if you haven't seen it because I'm not really like trying to like break down the whole movie. We're gonna see it for free on Pluto TV, like so. Yeah, all that Pluto TV, Tubi TV, all that. The movie was a success though, because it had a budget of about $600,000 and it made over two million in the box office. And if you guys don't know about movies, basically, in order to be deemed a success in movies, you have to make back your budget and then double it essentially. The soundtrack for the film will come out over a week later and was the group's debut album. State Property was comprised of different artists from Philly. You had Beanie Siegel, Freeway, Oshkino, Emilio Sparks, The Young Guns, and if my memory serves me correct, I don't think that Petey Crack came in until a little later in the fold because he wasn't on the debut album or in the movie, I don't think. Someone let me know in the comment section below. But yeah, Beanie was from South Philly, Chris and Neef are from Nice Town, Uptown, Sparks and Oshkino are from West Philly, and Freeway and Petey Crack are from North Philly. According to Oshkino, Prior to Hot 97, the members didn't really know each other all like that, but Jay was scouting talent from Philly and all of them just so happened to be from Philly and he liked how they sounded. On a side note, what's interesting is that I believe before State Property became a thing, Jay was scouting talent out in Philly. He was actually interested in the group Major Figures who were making some real big noise back in the day. They were supposed to be the original Philly group on The Rock. A lot of people can recognize one member today in particular, which is Gilly the Kid. Many in the group major figures were uncertain about their future and there was some impatience amongst the members in the group that led to everyone getting different solo deals with other labels. The State Property debut album would be led by the single Rock the Mic, which had Freeway and Benny Siegel on it. Fire track, by the way, as it reached number 55 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. Just Blaze actually made the beat in five minutes, and Emilio Sparks was originally supposed to be on the original version, according to Just Blaze. There was a Rock the Mic remix that I don't know personally if it ever came out, but I guess that it had everybody from State Property on it and Jay Z. Everybody spat eight bar verses, and then Jay dropped a 16 at the end. I don't know personally, like I said, if it ever came out, but I did see Just Blaze talk about it. 
The second release on The Rock was the Best of Both Worlds album with R. Kelly and Jay-Z, which released in March of 2002. The album was announced via a star-studded press conference, and here's a clip from that press conference. How did you guys hey. come up with the idea to do this project together? Um, I just say, like, you know, we had the, um, you know, the Fiesta remix and Not Guilty, you know, and doing that and hearing how those uh, two singles came out. We were always tossed the idea back and forth, but it was just the idea. Like, we didn't, we didn't do a whole album together. And we creative people, so creative people cre create. You know, just the idea of having a whole album with um, myself and R. Kelly was mm -hmm. just see how it would come out it was just an amazing prospect so we mm -hmm. just we put it together man we started coming up and here we are it's like mad scientists you know in the basement it's like uh mad scientists in the basement you know what i'm saying we uh jay is real creative i'm real creative and it's like you want to get together and mix potions you know what i'm saying just to see what happens that's how the lights were created you know the piano and and cameras, you know what I'm saying? That's how all this happened, cameras. you know what I'm saying? Somebody got together and, you know, and, and said, let's see how this works, let's see how that works. And that's how great things happen. The Best of Both Worlds peaked at number two on the US Billboard 200 chart, selling 223,000 copies in its first week. The album's release was tainted by the R. Kelly underrated accusations. No videos were released from the project due to this, and a planned tour was scrapped due to the poor publicity surrounding R. Kelly. The project would lead to generally mixed reviews from critics, and honestly, the parts of the albums that I've heard aren't bad, but the third release from The Rock was Cameron's Come Home With Me in May of 2002. The album would peak at number two on the Billboard 200 chart and sold 226,000 copies in its first week. The first single for the album was Old Boy. The beat for Old Boy was originally supposed to be for Jay-Z, and this is what the producer for the track, Jess Blaze, had to say about that. In an interview, he said, there was drama about the song being Jay's originally, and that they stole Jay's beat or whatever. It totally wasn't like that. Originally, the beat was much faster, it was made as an up-tempo record for Bleak, but he turned it down. I reworked it and slowed it down, but he still wasn't really feeling it. Jay walked in and heard it and was like, yo, that's serious. But he wasn't working on the album at the time. He had just finished Blueprint 2, so he was like, hold that for me. There was a million beats like that. Jay said the same thing about Pump It Up. Sometimes he'll hear a beat and like it, but he won't like it a year later when he's making an album. Jay was originally supposed to be on the Old Boy remix, but Cameron deleted his verse. Joel Santana, a member of Dipset and close friend of Cameron, in an interview said this. We walked in the studio and Jay said, I got a surprise for y'all. At this point, we was wondering why he didn't want to jump on records that he could have jumped on already. So Old Boy is already out of this world, getting probably like 10,000 spins. So we walk up in the studio room and we're like, what's the surprise? Young Guru pulls up Oh Boy with the J verse on it. On top of the J verse, he's dissing Nas. Cam made Guru erase the verse to the point where Cam told Guru, you better erase that. I don't ever want to hear that. You'll also notice that in a lot of music videos throughout this period, you'll see a lot of rock aware and things of that nature. But you will also see the rock promote Things like Armadel Vodka, which was a lesser known Scottish vodka brand. It was heavily advertised with things dealing with The Rock. And The Rock was really getting their hands in a lot of different ventures, like I've stated. Clothing, movies, music, alcohol, etc. Really out here hustling. Back to Cameron though. Another record that I want to talk about from Come Home With Me is Welcome To New York City, which featured Jay-Z. In an interview, Just Blaze shed light behind the track. He said, they've been wanting to get Jay on a record because up until this point, Jay hadn't done anything. Cam came into the room like, yo, yo, I got him. I got him. I got him. I think he's going to do it. He was going around saying it. Obviously, it's funny because of how the history ended up between them. Cam was genuinely excited that Jay was going to be on that record. He was like, he's agreed to do it. He said he'll do it today. 
He just needs the beat. I need a beat. I need a beat. I played a beat. I was making for Freeway. And I was like, what about this? He was like, yeah, that could be it. I went into the hook really quick and sang the Welcome to New York City part. And that was that. Crazy to think that a lot of Rockefeller songs could have been different due to who they originally were supposed to be for. Imagine Freeway on that Welcome to New York beat. God, like, yo, like, a Welcome to Philly? Yo, that would have been crazy. The last track that I want to talk about on this is The Rock Just Fire. And it's a really great song. Fire beat, crazy beat. But this song actually marks the beginning of the downfall for Just Blaze and Dame Dash's relationship because Dame wanted to take Bleak off of the record. Dame wanted to take him off because his claim was that in Just Blaze's words, quote unquote, we need to position Bleak as a young LL because the ladies love him so much. We don't need him to be on this record talking reckless or whatever. Yes, we need to position him as the ladies man. How do y'all feel about this? Was Bleak really the ladies man? I mean, like, personally, like, I don't really know. But, like, yeah, but Just Blaze would disagree with that and what Dame said and bring up the fact that LL did records like I Shot Ya, I'm Bad, Can't Live Without My Radio, etc. And Just Blaze even asked Dame why was he commenting on music if he was a business dude. Like, <laughs> that's just funny. This is a funny statement. But also in June of 2002, the movie Paper Soldiers would come out. It was directed by Dame Dash and it starred Beanie Siegel, Kevin Hart, and Stacey Dash. This was actually Kevin Hart's first movie, if I'm not mistaken. In November of 2002, Jay-Z released The Blueprint 2, The Gift and the Curse. The album peaked at number one with first week sales of 545,000 units. The purpose of the album is to explore both the positives and the negatives of the life, as well as a career as a hip hop superstar. Truly a gift and a curse. The album was in double disc format and was the idea of Young Guru, who viewed it as Jay's opportunity to join the likes of Biggie and Tupac and releasing critically acclaimed and commercially successful double albums. The first single for the album, 03 Bonnie and Clyde was released in October of that year. This was the first musical collaboration between Jay and Beyonce. And due to the track's content, it was the first indication of Jay and Beyonce's romantic status, which spawned rumors. Tension arose during the conception of 03 Bonnie and Clyde over the sampling of Me and My Girlfriend by Tupac. Tina Davis, who was an A&R at Def Jam in 2003, said, we only had one day to clear the Tupac sample that was used. We were back and forth with a finish occur all day until we got the clearance. And then it's a hit. Biggs has came out and said that this was the first time he realized that Jay was in love with Beyonce. Biggs said, when Jay first met Beyonce, Dan was like, you should wife her. She's the one. There was a time in Paris when they sent us Bonnie and Clyde. It was the final cut. And when we heard that, Dame looked up at me and said, yo, he's in love. So if y'all know Jay, a lot of times everything comes out in his music. When he does interviews, he's a little bit more reluctant to speak about certain things, but it always comes out in his albums. So at that time, when Bonnie and Clyde came out, we knew that he was in love with Beyonce. The second single was Hobie Baby which was officially sent to the radio on the same day the album was released worldwide. But Jay had previously released a track to mixtape DJs a month earlier in October to get the record out on the streets. Just Blaze sampled a live version of TLC's Diggin' On You, and he told Complex that he made the beat the day Left Eye died after hearing the song on the radio being played as part of a tribute mix. In Just Blaze's words, this re-solidified him and Jay's relationship, and Jay was really high on this song. In late October of 2002, Cameron would co-star in the movie Paid in Full alongside Mackay Pfeiffer and Wood Harris. Here's a clip of Cameron talking about the movie. Oh, let's see. Sure. Oh, sure. You got a new movie coming out called Paid in Full, directed by Dame Dash. Can you tell us about the role you play in it in the movie? Um, I play a dude called Rico. It's like he's really Alpo. You know, it's based on um, these three dudes from Harlem, teenagers that was getting like millions on the hustling side of thing. 
thing. So it's like I played like I'm like old dog 2002. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if you ever see Men's to Society, I play like the wild, crazy villain in there. You know, it's directing. Dame ain't direct that. Mm -hmm. Rockefeller produced it. Um, Dame directed a joint called Paper Soldiers. Okay. The budget for the movie was about 7.5 million, but the film only brought in about 3 million in the box office. Despite this though, this movie, like I said earlier, is one of my favorite movies of all time. And Cameron did the dang, dang in that movie. I'm not even gonna lie, he did the dang, dang in that movie. But the soundtrack was released the same day as the film was released, and it was a double disc soundtrack. The first disc was a collection of old school hip hop and R&B songs while the second was a collection of new songs recorded by Rockefeller. One of my favorite songs on the second disc is Champions with Dame Dash, Kanye West, Twista, Cameron, Beanie Siegel, and Young Chris. Not only is the song hilarious with Dame Dash at the beginning, boasting about how his team is the best and how he can't rap, but that in fact, his producer, who was Kanye West, could rap better than most rappers. Dame actually picked a sample. He originally wanted to have Just Blaze do the beat but there was a miscommunication about how quickly Dame wanted the beat made and the production duties fell to Kanye. Glad it did because the song is just fire and Cameron's verse is just, yo, like, yo, complete fire. In fact, everybody killed it on that song. Like, who am I kidding? Even Beanie with his short verse killed it. But the other track that I want to talk about on this album is I Am Dame Dash. And it starts with another Dame Dash intro. And the producer of the track, Just Blaze, said that this track was supposed to be the outro to Freeway's album, Philadelphia Freeway. But it never got finished. The last track I want to talk about is One for Petey Crack. I mentioned a little bit about the background for that track earlier with Cameron's verse being deleted and all that. But man, like, I really mess with Petey Crack. Matt goes, ring boy. Like that part just gets me every time, like I swear. But all in all, this will conclude this episode in the series. I felt like it was necessary to, to stretch this series to four episodes because it's just too much that happened in the span of five years that people consider their prime. Heck, this video is only about three years of it, and it's already going to be probably about like the same amount as the first episode. And that episode covered a decade worth of events, like yo, like, and that's crazy. But y'all know what to do. I'm not going to hold you guys much longer. Love you guys. Peace.